for those of you, which I think is actually the vast majority, I have not met, I'm Karen. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for spending, um, I guess, two and a half, three days of your time here at the summit. I know I appreciate it. I know Sammy's put a ton of work into it. Um, so that's fantastic. I was actually thinking about what it was that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, I'm sure a lot of you either have heard and or have questions about uh, the changes that are being introduced to the MCT program. So I thought I'd just take those all as questions at the end um, and maybe share some new insights with you as far as um, not only what am I thinking from an MCT program, but what are we seeing in the learning space? What does that mean to you? Um, that's the, the road ahead, if you will. I also wanted to share kind of some of the program strategy. So that'll give you an idea of what's coming in the future as well. And then uh, just take questions, have a conversation with all of you. So if you thought I was going to specifically talk about the program changes, I'm more than willing to. I just didn't exactly want to make them the focus of my slides. Uh, I, I also was mentioning to Sammy that this turns out to be a great time not to be in the States. I was reading an article this morning that on average Americans consume 4,000 calories on Thanksgiving, which starts in some amount of hours. So that's, that's pretty awesome that I'm, I'm not going to eat 4,000 calories today. Uh, <laughs> then they decided to tell you how to burn those 4,000 calories off. So apparently I'd have to canoe for like nine hours in order to burn 4,000 calories. So if any of you are interested in Thanksgiving and how to burn calories, canoeing is not your best option. Jump roping, much more efficient. Um, okay, so wanna kinda go in with sharing what has historically been the, the selling point and or the story around the MCT program. So kinda what's the pitch, if you will, to lay the stage for where we're going from here. We've really prided ourselves over the past five years or so. Those of you who've been in the MCT program probably were aware of and or part of this growth that the program grew from about 12 to 15,000 people to upwards of 20,000. Last time I checked, we're like just shy of 21,000 people in the MCT program, which from a global reach perspective is a really, really big number. Um, in a little bit, I'm going to share some insight into what that number actually means, which I think will give you an idea of, of why I think it's necessary that we start to make some changes. But when we look at where all of you play in, you're playing across the Microsoft portfolio, which is a fantastic thing, really helping with that reach, helping to impart um, technology and, and knowledge in students, both from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, but also from a group perspective. We also recognize that there's a lot of different ways in which you deliver that training. Um, that's changing pretty rapidly. Uh, for some of you haven't been in a typical classroom for quite a while, um, and I'll talk about why that still can be considered training and how that plays in the MCT program. Um, we also are seeing a fair amount of dual training certifications, which I think from a trainer perspective is a really good thing. Now, obviously, we'd want you to train the vast majority of the time on Microsoft. However, I think your ability to cross a talk to talk across platforms is really helpful when it comes to your ability to speak to what your students are facing from a technical perspective. Um, so we continue to see that. Microsoft Certified Trainers continues to be the largest training program in terms of, um, if you look at like Oracle or Cisco or VMware, uh, the MCT program is by far the largest um, across all of those. And then obviously you reach out outside of training as well. You're speaking at conferences, many of you, as Sammy touched on, are speaking over the next three days. Um, you're reaching people in other ways as well. So great story when it comes to impact and reach. Um, that being said, when you start to dive into the numbers, that story starts to change. Um, additionally, the learning landscape is changing. So. This is based on what I'm seeing from an industry perspective, what I'm seeing from a Microsoft perspective, and what I hope most of you can at least resonate and agree with. So let's talk about learner expectations. Um, I mean, I don't know how much it comes up in Europe. It comes up a lot in the United States. Um, I'm seeing in a lot of publications, which are not just US-based, so I'm, I'm guessing it's here in Europe as well. 
the learner themselves is changing. I mean, especially as you start to see younger and younger faces enter into your classroom, the expectation of what it means to learn is very different. Um, what it means to take a test is very different. This idea of memorizing something versus knowing where to look to find it, that's shifting. The real-time data and access is shifting. So when you think about that learner expectation starting to change, how is it that you as a trainer need to play into that space? Um, depending on who you're training to, that might be shifting slower. If you're training in a very traditional um, classroom setting with companies that are sending their employees, it's probably shifting slower. Uh, if you're training in academia, it's probably shifting faster because you're starting to see the, the learners themselves are looking different and they're behaving different. Um, I don't know, I, I don't have any kids, but I have a nephew. He's two and a half, and he already knows to swipe. I mean, th that, that's just inherent. I didn't learn how to swipe until I was what, 25 or something. <laughs> that, but you're going to keep seeing that, and that expectation is going to be different. And I think there's great opportunity for some of you to adjust how it is that you engage with your students based on their expectations. Then the classroom setting and the experience. How many of you are playing in and or have played in the virtual training? Okay, so a fair amount. We're continuing to see that adoption pick up. Um, you know, there's a little bit of chicken and the egg, right? People, oh, it's all going to go virtual. It's all going to go virtual. And then the pickup was slower than we, th we thought was going to be over the last two to three years. It, based on the data that's coming in, it seems like we're hitting that that switching point where virtual really is starting to be picked up. Um, hybrid is starting to be picked up. So if you have not trained in the virtual space, I would encourage you to think about how you could or how you should. Um, my, my guess, based on the research that I'm doing, is that you're going to start to see more and more demand for it, and you're going to start to see more demand for that hybrid. You know, can you teach both in the classroom and provide virtual support? after kind of those office hours sorts of ideas. Um, that's going to continue to be different. The other thing when I talk about classroom setting, so this touches a bit on the changes being made to the MCT program, is um, it's, it's different, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that training has to take place in a formal classroom with a student sitting in front of you, each with their computer. Um, now. While I recognize that shift, I'm working within an organization that maybe hasn't recognized it as much. So a little bit of, of what I'm faced with is pushing Microsoft Learning to understand that our training is not going to be a traditional 9 to 5 class. That we need to recognize that our trainers play in different ways. So as, as I work through what needs to happen to actually strengthen the program, we continue to look for ways to be flexible, to make sure that we're striking that balance. Um, so I fully recognize that that's happening, <laughs> but I feel like we need to get the ship moving forward. And I'm having a lot of conversations with colleagues of mine within Lex about what that needs to look like. And how do we, from a courseware perspective, make changes? How do we, from a learner um, availability and expectations, how do we change that? And, and I'm sure some of you have heard about the new platform that's being developed um, within Microsoft. How does that play with MCTs? And what are some key business decisions that we need to make now to enable you for the future as it looks very different? Yeah, Mark. Mm hmm As long as you guys don't bother if it's not word for word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can absolutely grab it and send it as well. It's essentially that Microsoft Learning is it about enabling cloud-based training um, and training uh, on the internet. It is really like the gist of that mission statement. I'll find it and maybe Sammy we could put it up in one of the breaks or, or something or pass it out because good point Mark. It's, it's very different. It's very much about um, online learning. I think that might actually be the phrase that's in there. So um, those of you who don't know, our general manager switched about five months ago. Allison Kennard is now in charge of Microsoft Learning, and she is very much pushing 
into this new learning space to try to engage Microsoft Learning in a different way. And I've had conversations with her two weeks ago and she recognizes that the MCT community plays a big role in that and that we cannot continue to just be very traditional in the MCT program, that we have to start making changes um, to enable all of you to train in different ways. Then technology and tools, those are different. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for ways to better prepare you all. I'll touch on some of the tools that we have available for you that we've made available in probably the last four or five months that will help you. But the rapid releases are not going to slow down. Um, and that's challenging when you talk about technology and how do you stay ahead of what's coming. The, I, by no means have we solved this, but we do have some tools that I think will help in that. But that poses a big challenge to each of you as a trainer is which new technology are you going to bet on? Which one are you going to move into? And how do you, while you're training, stay up on what's coming next and then adjust to materials that are changing, that are being adapted? Um, that, that, it's just different versus a release every two to three years. There's multiple releases in one year. Um, the material changes, the exams change with it, the certifications that are required, et cetera. So I, I just, I, by no means am I saying that as if you're not thinking about it, but I mean, it's real. And, and I, when I put myself in your shoes, that's challenging because you're teaching nine to five, but how do you still stay up on the technology and make that shift? Um, so that's one of the things that I think there's an opportunity for, for each of you to provide insight on into what do you need to be successful in making that shift, which then allows me to go back and have those conversations with my colleagues to say, here's what we need to try to get in front of MCT so that while you're teaching nine to five on the current technology, but you know a new wave is coming in two months, what can you do to get ready and be ready to deploy that? Tools are changing. I know Ronald is coming up after me, um, so he'll touch a little bit on this. However, um, this is an interesting conversation I've had with some of the people that are upset with me and upset with the changes that I'm making. And, and the co one comment was made that training is like riding a bicycle. True, there's not a lot of technical changes that happen in bicycles. I mean, I'm just saying, right? But one of my neighbors has a bicycle with a giant front wheel. I mean, it's huge. And then like the baby back wheel. You guys, are, is anybody familiar with that bicycle? Okay, it's like really old, that's all I know. Okay, there was a huge technological leap between <laughs> two different sized tires to now where we are. But really, can't think of a lot of technical changes that happened with the bicycle. Now, I was playing around with labs online the other day and I was thinking about, wow, if you had never done a virtual or used a labs online to deploy a training, that's going to be a learning curve the first time you do it. I mean, big time, right? I mean, it's just the whole interface. How does this work? Is it all right? Is, is it all installed correctly? Wait, I don't need to install anything. What's going on? Then you talk about digital mock. Um, digital courseware and the push to that. How do you not only prepare as a trainer for that, but then how do you sell your students on it? Because you're, that shift is happening too. No, I want a paper book. I've always gotten a paper book. How do I have something different? Um, these are going to continue to change. I don't know what's next. I mean, I was having a conversation about that as well. Like, what's the next big technological leap? Um, it's, we're probably going to be involved in it. We just don't know when or where it's coming from. And then the demand and delivery options are different as well. Independent trainers make up roughly 48% of the MCT community. Uh, from my perspective, from a strategic program perspective, independent MCTs who actually train are a huge asset. Absolutely part of the MCT program that I think needs to remain. Now the key word in that is actively training. And that's where demand and delivery options I do think are different. Um, and that's part of the adjustment that I'm working through with, like I said, my colleagues to help them understand that training can take place in a different manner than a classroom. But how do we make sure that that training is still taking place if you're part of the MCT program? So that's, uh, I just know that that's a shift that I think we need to make. And that demand is different too. That's where that engagement of you're doing consulting and you're training at the same time. Uh, I had a conversation with one of your colleagues, I don't know if you guys know him, Charlie, I always butcher his last name, Hanania, um, out of Zurich. And I was talking with him about what's going on in his business, his consulting business, and the training that he's doing, and the options that he has as a Microsoft partner network. 
Um, I would encourage you to have conversations with your colleagues because just with Charlie and I, we talked for about an hour. He was unaware of options available to him and how he could train and different resources to support him in what he was doing. Um, so that's where I think this community aspect can really help a lot. Because some of you are trying new things, you're moving into new spaces, either how you deliver or the resources that you're using. Um, and I think the more that we can share that cross learning, the better um, that we're gonna be. So in the face of these changes, I don't think these are even all of them, to be honest, I think even more are out there that I'm, I'm probably not aware of, maybe that you're facing on a regular basis. But my key comment is that we should proactively adjust. We shouldn't wait until it's too late and we're reacting. In my opinion, some of the changes that I'm making to the program are reactive. They're reactive to a series of years and a series of decisions made before I came into the role that didn't set this program up for success. It didn't set the people in the program up for success. So I'll, yeah, there's some reaction going on. Let's position ourselves going forward that we can proactively adjust and we can start to proactively move forward with where the industry is going. Okay, these are numbers that have not been shared out of Microsoft. That being said, I'm more than comfortable with sharing them with you today. You're the first group of MCTs uh, that are getting to see these and I'd be open to the feedback if you think maybe I should have shared them more broadly before um, However, I didn't want it to come across as defending my position But this is a bit of what I found when I started to look into the MCT program and I started to understand this 21,000 large community that that we say yeah, this is awesome. There's so many trainers around the world What's really going on? So I'll agree. We have quantity no problem 20,000 is a fairly significant number. But those other comments, do we have active, current, quality trainers? Are they in the right location? That's where we start to wonder. So last time I pulled the numbers, we were just shy of 21,000, which is active MCTs. When we talk about verifiable training activity, totally understand there's a caveat there. Um, that is based on metrics that matter, which is in fact the, the survey system that is available to all MCTs, learning partners are required to use it. Um, per your program guide and agreement, you're required to use it. That has not been enforced. That being said, less than 6,000 can be verified. That was a shocking number to me. I mean, literally shocking. And so I'm sitting there, I, I remember when I got this, I ran the, the numbers four times because I thought I must have screwed up. I, I clearly pulled a wrong data field. I filtered on something. Maybe this is only part of the world. Like, this can't be right. Uh, no, no it is. Um, so then I started thinking, wow, how do you justify a program that we tout as 20,000 trainers when I can only verify that just over 5,000 have trained? That's a problem. I mean, that, that's my honest opinion. That is a problem. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. I've, okay. I've fully digested MTM many a time. I can talk about as well some of the changes that I'm having made to MTM too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So at least some of us can agree that's shocking. Now. I don't think that is the full picture of training. However, when somebody asks me, how many of your trainers can you verify train? That's the number I get to go with. Whoops. <laughs> now I can caveat that and I, you know, I can do my little sales pitch and maybe get them to think it's a little higher. But at the end of the day, I can't verify that it's any higher. So second shocking number is not going forward. Ah, there it is. Okay, let's talk about current Certifications. So I've there are roughly six with six thousand three hundred and thirty. Yeah. Current MCTs that are not current on their certifications. Now let me caveat what I mean by not current. I'm talking Windows two thousand. Windows XP. So it's not like, oh well, I'm training on the two thousand and ten version of Office, not the <laughs> twenty thirteen. We're talking you're thirteen years old on technologies. 
Like, you're, in my opinion, you're not even attempting to stay current at that point. Our end of life support for XP starts, I think it's March or May or, or, or something like that. Um, so that's another problem as well, is how is it that the trainers, the people that are supposed to be in front of these students, pushing the new technology, understanding what's coming, even if you're teaching on an older platform, but helping people understand what's possible if they were to upgrade or move forward, how is it that, what is that? It's almost a third aren't near currency. Um, again, that was a pretty surprising number to me. Not as shocking as the first one. <laughs> That's a really big gap, um, but, but surprising nonetheless. So those two numbers made, made me very confident that from a, the perspective of somebody who utilizes the MCT program to gain employment, to obtain customers, to prove their credentials and their capability as a trainer on a day in, day out basis, that's not okay. We're diluting the program by allowing it to say we've got 20,000 people, yet we're not holding all of those accountable to maybe a, a, a respectable level of participation. Yeah. Yep. Who, who train new versions but are just not certified, or, or do you think they're not training at all? Or do you think I think it's the latter. I think they're not training. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope they're not sheep. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yep. Um, interestingly enough, so I'm in the process of doing a benefits analysis. And right now, current state, which we can talk about TechNet in a little bit if you guys want as well, um, you receive on a conservative estimate over $2,500 worth of program benefits for your US $400 that's adjusted uh, around the world. So I also think that there's some of them figure it's a, it's a pretty good bargain, right? You pay $400 and you get over $2,500 worth of value, plus you get a well-recognized, well-respected well uh, program membership. So I really do hope we don't have a lot of sheep out there. Um, I think they're just not training. Yeah. Sure. I would say the active trainers, absolutely. But when I look at that top number, Absolutely. train for us to continue to do what we do absolutely absolutely um i do what what i was more touching on was what about the 6330 people that don't have current certifications yet they pay 400 dollars year in and year out i i think that some of them honestly are figuring out that this is a good way to get a very significant software benefit i'm, I'm not saying any of you in the room are doing that i do think that that exists in this number yes this is sean IT Academy, we, possibly, um, the academic space is like 8% of the MCT program, if not less. So it's not the whole thing is, yeah, basically the story there. And I have made some changes to enable IT Academy to be using MTM. Yeah. Plus, a little bit of 
sorry to have to say, but it was, uh, there was a lot of um, map, bad, I would say, disorganization mm -hmm. from Microsoft around the fourth quarter that I was about to keep, which is that in the CRM. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no I, I was not there in 2011, but I spent a lot of time cleaning up dynamics. But I think that uh, in my position, I'm a consultant, I'm not trying to train. And I found out that the, the amount of uh, conflict information that I was getting, um, dragging the, 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 the response time from uh, the regional centers. Uh, and to be honest with you, the quality of their support, mm -hmm. mixing with uh, what the different MCT is telling me, plus, you know, I need to be doing my full time job as well. Right. Which is also missing. Things are dragging and dragging and dragging. There was a point that I felt, what am I supposed to do here? I would hope that that's an outlier, that that doesn't represent what happened with 15,000 people, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would love to talk with you more about this after, for sure. Hmm? No, no, no. Yep. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I hope we can all agree that this sort of question around the community, we need to do something about it. We need to strengthen it, for sure. There's, there's some one-off issues that we can deal with. Um, the, sorry, I'm... I'm gonna keep this going. Um, so one other thing that I think we need to look at, so this is leading into what's coming in the future, is what would it look like if we said, okay, we've got active MCTs, we've got current certifications, and what does this right location mean? Now this may be something that some of you face, maybe not. Um, however, from a, I'll use the word capacity planning, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Phrase, but if you really started to do capacity planning around MCTs, um, you could start to better meet demand with trainers in the right location. So instead of having too many dynamics trainers in certain areas, there's actually not enough dynamics trainers, period, but let's, let's play that out. Maybe you could start to encourage MCTs, and, and I could reach out to those of you in the community and say, hey, we're seeing demand pick up in this region of the world or in this country or in this state and it's for this type of trainer that would allow you to better understand maybe where you want to go where you want to add in an area of your portfolio we have no idea about this right now absolutely none so if you want to talk strategically how does that play into you and your business the more time spent on figuring this out I think honestly the better it's going to play for you. So that's one of the things on the program roadmap that I'll show you in a little bit is how do we do that capacity planning to make sure that we're not oversaturated with MCTs in certain technologies in certain areas, which is, I mean, supply and demand, it's going to pull down your price, right? If there's, if there's a ton of you to pick from, then they just pick the, the cheapest one, right? Whereas if we can get that a little more in balance, it supports you as a trainer knowing that you're going to be engaged, that you're going to have opportunities to train, that it's going to be at a reasonable rate. Um, and it also helps kind of, I guess, uh, adjust the, the trainers that bring down the reputation of the MCT program that maybe aren't as actively engaged. They pick up a class here or there, and they're not delivering at the same level of quality that we all want each and every MCT to be at. So to me, what I'm doing, um, so those of you who are actively training, you're probably laughing at the one class minimum. <laughs> yeah, I would too. <laughs> In fact, some days that's the solace that I find when people are really mad at me, is I'm thinking, this is one class, guys. Like, come on, it's one class. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. So, right, so that, that's 
one of the messages I want to send home to you, or to some of you that are saying, probably all of you actually are saying, one class, Karen, really? I hear ya. Right. Oh, absolutely, most of you would be fired if you got a six, right? That, that's what I've, I've heard people say. Um, what I would say, though, is that the MCT program will continue to be structured for active trainers. That is with what I also shared about the change in demand and delivery. So making sure we got the right mix of flexibility, that we can keep the independent trainers that are training in uh, a non-classroom setting, yet are still meeting that training criteria. But how do we, we structure it going forward? The MCT program, as long as I'm in this role, is not going to be structured for people who really appreciate the three letters yet aren't actively training. Um, I don't think it's fair to the people that are training to set it up that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's two questions. The two. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. There's, there's just two of them. Yep, sure thing. Okay, so those of you who, who either were on the 28th uh, quarterly update, uh, one thing I'll tell you is that was my first and last live quarterly update. <laughs> Reason being, I think it's a very ineffective way to reach a worldwide community. <laughs> so um, <laughs> for those of you who attended, thank you very much. I look forward to giving you a video in the future. <laughs> um, I, I think that, that'll be much more effective use for your time, recognizing that you're busy, allowing you to fit it in uh, when it works best versus um, working around selfishly a Puget Sound schedule. So um, that, that will be adjusting in the future. However, I did want to talk just a little bit more about what I shared there, maybe give you a little more insight into the why and the what um, and, and where we're going forward. So program intent and impact. Again, it's all about training. It's making sure that you're training. That should have been the program and intent focus of the MCT program all along. Um, that's really what it should have been focused on and what it should have been demanding of all the trainers. Um, now that, one of the things that again, we're shifting is the, the fact that I think a I don't know if I would call it a benefit, maybe a right of an MCT is the ability to teach Microsoft official courseware. So we'll go with the word right, you know, and there's a lot of connotation around right, but I think we all agree on that. That doesn't mean that's the only thing you can or should train, right? I mean, I, there's a lot, I think there's a lot, either you guys make your own training material and deliver that, you're doing hybrid, you're grabbing community courseware, what have you. Um, so making sure that that flexibility continues to be built in to not only the MCT program from a requirement standpoint, but also that's um, something that I'm working with in Lex with one of my colleagues is how does that work? How does that show up? How do we make that more readily available um, so that you can be pulling on the best quality training material that meets your customer's needs versus feeling like you have to deliver one set thing? Yeah, Matthias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now we're focused on what that looks like with Moss um, and how we play in that space because um, that's one where there is no mock uh, for Microsoft Office. But how do we encourage learning partners to have some different options that they can grab uh, and utilize? And then how does that play into the other courseware material? Oh, absolutely. That being said, I think uh, a trainer who trains one class in a year, when you talk about a learning partner, I don't know if that screams strength of training. Um, so I think I'm gonna have to pull the bar up a bit before it really uh, resonates. Oh, yeah, well, so Mark and I had a conversation about that yesterday. That, that's a tricky road, right? Because most likely the person who's gonna know is an MCT. And then you have to make the decision of if you, if you say anything or not. And I, I get it, right? That's a complicated decision to make. 
because depending on the relationship that you have, that could point to you very quickly, uh, et cetera. I, my colleague does run the Learning Partner Program. Um, so if in fact that's something that is happening or when it is happening, um, you know, we, we can and will take action on it. We need to know about it though. Um, so that, that's complicated. Yeah, it, it, the, the, I mean, obviously we don't want to make accusations from non-hard data. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think that the stronger we make the MCT program, the more robust it is, the more encouragement there is for learning partners to use MCTs. It has. We have adjusted, yeah. It came off the years, it will not survive. Right. So what I think right now is the bloating of some companies and some training centers that are not specialized in, in IT training at least. I yeah. I said the list, okay, but they are just providing Microsoft training and some of them with some, uh, I will not say, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is, there's a series of changes going on with the Learning Partner Program. Um, I can speak with you more offline about what those look like, by all means, but there's some pretty significant changes that are happening. There, just in case somebody does say, since now most or all of you are going to want those MTMs to be uh, utilized, Learning Partners do have to use MTM. It's just not part of their metrics. Um, however, they are still required to. So just point of clarification in case anybody says we don't have to know the answer is, is you do. Um, so then the next one is around program fidelity. And this touches on uh, a question that's been raised around the whole MCT alumni program. Uh, shouldn't somebody who was an MCT be allowed back into the program without meeting the new entry requirements? So. No is the answer, <laughs> and, and here, here's why. There is some reason beyond just no is a nice two-letter word to say. Uh, there has been a systematic reduction over a period of years of the entry requirements for the MCT program. What that means is three to five years, mostly more around the three, but let's just say three to five years, where people who have entered the MCT program have not had to meet any level of requirement. Um, now when you compare it to what a lot of you had to meet if you joined the program, I think it's probably about 10-ish years ago, 10 to 12, it was a pretty high bar. I mean, it, it was quite rigorous. So you compare that to the last three years, that hasn't been the case. So that's where, that, that's why I'm saying no is because I can't validate that if you came into the program in the last three to five years, you elect to exit the program for some period of time and then come back, I can't, I don't know if you actually met appropriate requirements or not because they were systematically removed. So again, when I think about looking at the MCT program for the whole community, for the people who are actively using it, actively using that, that program membership, I believe that I owe it to every single person to be able to look another MCT in the eye and know that they've met a respectable set of requirements. Um, so my options were, I'll, I'll, I'll be very candid, I could have required all MCTs that had been in the program the last three years to re-enter, which quite frankly, I didn't like that idea. I, I, it felt weird, right? Oh, you're in the program, but not really. You have to re-enter that. That didn't feel like the right approach. Um, so I put the renewal requirements in place to say, hey, if you're going to be a part of this community ongoing, you need to meet a certain bar. And then that's where that adjustment is around the alumni is that if you choose to exit and you want to come back at, at a different point, um, we have options. You don't have to go and re-get your train the trainer certificate. You could send in the one you currently have 
or if you have a reference, somebody that you either know from the MCT community or somebody that you know from the learning partner community or somebody you know from your, your training or consulting days, they could provide a reference. So you can still get back in, but that's why it's not just a blanket re-entry. That's why there's not grandfathering that's going on because I think it's, it's okay to say everybody has to meet this bar. So that's around the program fidelity is that uh, we relaxed it way too much. We pulled it back so far that I think it was almost disrespectful to the people who had met those stronger requirements, right? And so that's where, hey, let's put that program fidelity back in place. Let's make sure we're all comfortable. Uh, the, the comments about the number, it isn't gonna be one for very long. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so next year when you go to renew, or that would be like, you know, in 2015, that number is going to be higher than one. Let's just, you know, all agree on that now. One is the going in position. I am absolutely open to conversation and discussion around what that number should be. Should it be three? Should it be four? Should it be six? Um, what makes sense given the breadth of, of the MCT community? But um, I absolutely hear those of you who train on a regular basis, one is is a bit ridiculous. Um, so first step, we're going to continue to go forward. I'm hoping not to tip the apple cart over around program fidelity. Hopefully going to hit that sweet spot where it, it, it makes sense. It works for the community at large. Um, so we'll see. But I'm sure you all will tell me if I go too far. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the last one is around quality assurance. I hear you. A six is probably too low. Um, so that very well will be uh, adjusted as well. Um, however, when we think about quality assurance, and this is from a Microsoft learning perspective, quality assurance has really been done by the learning partners and by the people that choose to hire you as trainers to deliver your training. Microsoft learning hasn't played in that space. Now, I, you agree in the, in the program agreement, there's this, it's kind of complicated to be honest with you, but this whole dissatisfaction, if you have a dissatisfaction score greater than 10% over two consecutive quarters, then you can be kicked out of the program. I mean, maybe you could manage that for like five to 10,000 people, maybe, but 20,000, uh, you know, I mean, does that make sense? And he kicks me out of the program, then they have a valid reason why they shouldn't be kicked out of the program. So that's the point around quality assurance, is making sure that we put some systematic bars in place. Now, somebody said, how do you know it's not my dog that filled out the survey? Any system you put in place, somebody can cheat it. Um, but how do you put the right system in place to say, MCTs are gonna meet a quality bar and you're gonna continue to deliver quality training. And I think some of the best ways you deliver quality training is, is through training and knowing the technology. And that, that's kind of the, the combination that you hit in. I was sharing with somebody else, I, some of you probably don't know this because I haven't told you. So I used to be a certified professional, not, not in technology, um, business continuity, which is probably familiar to a lot of you since you're in tech. I was a certified business continuity professional trained on a regular basis and I could tell the difference between when I trained regularly and when I didn't. I mean, th there was just a difference. And I was the company expert on business continuity. And, and it just, it shifted. And right now, if somebody was like, hey, Karen, wanna go teach a class on business continuity? I'd be like, oh, maybe not. Like, I haven't done it for, I think it's been like five years now, six years, something like that. Like, I would have to do a lot of brushing up and my quality is probably gonna be a lot lower, <laughs> a little rustier out of the gate. Um, so that's where do we, how do we hit that right bar around quality assurance um, going forward as well. So those are the three focuses of the changes. So on to a much more positive and exciting note. Um, this is around how do we help trainers. So here's some of the things that are going forward. Um, for those of you in attendance, Sammy is going to provide me uh, a list of your names, email addresses, and we'll be providing you with a, three, a free 30-day trial to Microsoft Labs online. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go play around, here's your opportunity to go in there and familiarize yourself with it. Flip back to what like slide number two that I had that talks about that learning landscape. Uh, I am doing this, I went and talked to the guy who runs Labs online, because for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to actually play in it, I wanna give you that opportunity. 
because as a trainer, I think you should be comfortable and familiar with it. And unless you get that access through a learning partner right now, you're not gonna have that opportunity. So I'll be getting those codes out to you. Um, it'll probably be the second week of December um, once you'll get that email, but that'll give you 30 days to just go in there, play around, familiarize yourself. Um, in the meantime, I am working on, knock on wood that it's done by the end of the year, there will be 24 by seven access for MCTs to MLO. Um, that's, as an MCT, you will have that access. That's aside from learning partners, aside from training it. So you in attendance here, will you'll get a free pass that you can switch over to the, the readiness version um, once that sets up. But hopefully that's a tool that will help you um, familiarize and shift into the new technology space. Uh, MCT access to software. I am not ready to make an official announcement. That being said, um, I think you guys are going to be really happy. <laughs> um, so the TechNet retirement, that was announced, I think, less than two weeks after I started in the job. Um, so that was cool. Uh, especially when in week, you know, one after that announcement, that was my first uh, experience with somebody escalating to Steve Ballmer. Yes, those emails make it back to me, which is also kind of a little nerve wracking. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I've been at Microsoft like four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna fire me <laughs> I don't even know what TechNet is um, so <laughs> that being said we are darn near nailing down the solution I was just negotiating on Monday before I flew out around what is gonna be in there um, I think you'll be pleased if you're not pleased I don't know what I can do for you <laughs> um, so that's probably gonna be announced in January um, but but we heard you we got it um, and really, that's, that is unique to MCTs. So you talk about benefits for MCTs, recognizing the reach and the training. Um, that was the leverage that we were able to use to secure a very significant benefit for MCTs. Um, again, mid-January, you'll find out what that is. That's, nope, 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 we're not. Mm -hmm. I've got that all the way cleared. Um, I, I wrote down my revenue numbers um, because it's the right thing to do. And yep, absolutely, no, and, and it was a little nerve wracking and trust me, there was a lot of, how much are you writing down your revenue? Okay, well. Are you sure that's a good idea? Don't we want them? And to be honest, I was actually able, so the benefit that we're securing, part of the negotiation of that was around the requirements and a commitment that we would raise the MCT requirements to get rid of the sheep. Or, I mean, to help, I mean, am I ever gonna get rid of all of them? No, I mean, right, but at least to, to help clear that out. Uh -huh. That was part of the, give and take on that negotiation. Yeah. Visual Studio will be made available to the trainers that we have deemed need it as part of their training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's based on certifications. Mm -hmm. Yep. Azure's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you can't gonna snap your fingers. You get to hold your question until you don't snap your fingers. Okay, <laughs> courseware marketplace. <laughs> Matthias. Um, so those of you who do or do not know it, you can get a free digital copy of every single mock. Who's used that benefit? Good, use it more, it's free. That's like my favorite price. Um, only 2,000, it's like right, it might be like 2,050 MCTs have access to Courseware Marketplace. What the heck, it's free, 2,000, it's like 10%. So good, lots of hands went up. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, talk to me, talk to somebody who did raise their hand. Please utilize that benefit, it's free. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, it just came out. It's real nice. 
Yep, great point. Yeah, yeah, they, those. Right. There is a new one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's much better. What time am I supposed to be done at, Sammy? I don't even know. Anybody know? Two minutes? Five minutes, okay. Uh, use that, Azure Passes. 30 day, no credit card required Azure. Who knows about this one? Oh, okay, a little bit better. Um, trainers can use it, but we made it for students. Um, again, as a trainer, you should probably use it because we don't have another benefit. Yep, yep. 30 days, no credit card required. Um, I can share more information about that one too. Uh, Windows product keys currently enabled through TechNet. Um, that will be taken care of in the new software benefit as well, so you can continue to activate those VMs. Um, and then the MTA exam voucher portal, don't forget you get 50% off your exams. If you happen to be one of the 6,330 MCTs not current, 50% off, good way to get current. Huh? Oh, that's, so you get a new GM, you get a new name. Um, we're Microsoft Learning Experiences. Yeah, correct. Yep, no problem. So this is the program mode roadmap, where are we going? So this gives you an idea of what is to come. Um, the current year is a lot around strengthening, getting things ready for you. Loyalty program, which is around recognizing how long you've been in MCT. That was shared with me the first, it was my first day in Spain. I had been in the job five days and somebody made that very clear. I cannot recall his name. Um, I think it was out of Hungary. So that's coming. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of work uh, around how do we leverage MCT's uh, awareness and use within Microsoft even better. I think there's a huge opportunity there. How do we make sure that you're well known? Um, I think there, there's stuff that we can do there. Readiness adaptation, that's a conversation I would love to have with some of you over a beer or over a coffee, is what do you need tool-wise? Um, I don't think we've hit the nail on the head there. Uh, I really don't, so I would love some insight there because that's, that's some work that I want to do. Platform adoption, that's around the learning platform that Lex is creating. Um, I'm going to be actively reaching out to MCTs on how can you be a part of that, how can you be part of that shift and get in front of that wave. That's part of the, the changing uh, market capacity assessment, like I touched on in that equation page. How do we make sure we got the right MCTs in the right location on the right technologies and share that with you? So a lot to come, buckle your seat, belt, get ready, um, as well as changes to the websites. They're confusing, super confusing. I'm confused. So um, some cleanup is going to be happening around MCT Central really being focused on community and program discussions. The member site is where you will get your materials and your accesses um, as well. S the, there will be a new member site, which is pretty fabulous in terms of look and feel coming out in mid-December. So stay tuned, look for that much, 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 much better. Current one looks like you went back to 1998. Uh, and then just a reminder, the WAC learning site, that's where all our externally available information is gonna be. So there'll still be, for now, three different elements. Uh, member site's getting way better. I'm gonna be working on cleanup so you know where to go to get information, because it's confusing. Mark, just one second, I, I gotta keep going. Sammy's gonna kick me off. Um, so hopefully this resonates with you. This is the message that I'm trying to send when I speak within Microsoft, outside of Microsoft about MCTs. This is what I hope you resonate with because this is what I think you are and what you should represent. That you are absolutely the premier industry trainers and that you do inspire every student and person that you come in touch with around Microsoft technologies, around our devices and our services. That is a huge role that you play. Absolutely fantastic. And I believe I support that by making this program stronger, making sure the community is stronger. Um, I know it's a tough message sometimes. Trust me, I've gotten what felt like a lot of hate mail over the past month. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm doing it because I really do think it's the right thing to do for the community at large. So thank you for what you do for Microsoft. I really appreciate it. I'll be here um, through pretty much I think the end of the summit. So I look forward to meeting more of you face to face and talking. But um, thank you and enjoy.
Okay.